Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to continue uh, a series of lectures on beta ensembles, and the goal today is to to continue the study of the stochastic area operator. Um, this shock doesn't work. Let me see some bigger shock. Okay, so, so what we discussed last time is that when we look at uh, the tridiagonal ensemble for the beta ensembles, um, then it, it, it looks like some random operator, and, and, and <coughs> it actually converges in a certain sense to a limiting random operator, which is a differential operator. That's called the stochastic area operator. And we call it it's A beta, which is just multiplication by x. Well, first of all, there is a minus second derivative plus multiplication by x plus 2 over root beta times multiplication by b prime, which is the derivative of white noise, the derivative of Brownian motion, so white noise. Um, uh, we also had the boundary condition that, which is Dirichlet, f of 0 is 0. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, we, I, I stated the precise theorem of what the convergence means. We're not going to prove that theorem. So that's a little bit technical. But I'd rather focus on today is, is, is you know, how, it, how do you work with an object like this? Because again, this is not just some uh, abstract, beautiful thing that that's, this thing converges to, and then you're happy. But you can actually deduce a lot of the properties of the limit from here. And how you do that is, is the, t is the, is the uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, our goal was to define a quadratic form. Right? So we define, first of all, we define this space L star, which is, the, which is functions f in L2, such that um, f uh, af, so a is just the ordinary area operator, is finite. Right, so this was our, our L star function. And for every L star function, we would like to define uh, the, the quadratic form with respect to this, this operator. Okay? Uh, and of course, the quadratic form with respect to, to A is, is obvious. And this operator is just A. This part is A, right? plus multiplication by B prime. So, so we just have to make sure we can define this multiplication by B prime. And not only that, but I promised you that there is uh, some domination. So this multiplication by b prime is, uh, in the operator sense, is dominated by 1 minus, uh, by epsilon times this af. Okay, so let me, let me write it like this. So b prime. Um, so multiplication by b prime, this is uh, in the operator sense, is, is dominated by epsilon times a plus some constant, random constant depending on epsilon times the identity. Okay, and and when, when, when I write these things in terms of operators, okay, so, so I've written this last time, and some of you were complaining that that's, I didn't tell you what this meant. So let me tell you precisely what this meant. What this meant is that, is that for any f, this is the meaning of this, okay, in our star. Uh, so a less than or equal to b. So if I have two operators, this just means that, uh, well, OK, so let's, let's start it like this. So a less than or equal to b for two operators means that for any f in L star, uh, this inner product, the quadratic form, have this inequality. OK? And uh, if you have this inequality, then this implies inequalities for the corresponding top, eigenva uh, top eigenvalues. Okay, so the, the kth top eigenvalue of this is less than or equal to the kth top eigenvalue of that. And that's a nice exercise that I recommend you do using the Curran-Fisher characterization. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's very simple. Um, okay? So that's, 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 uh, that's what we mean by this. Okay? 
Um, all right, so, so the, the, the trick was to take this B prime apart, or the Brownian motion, if you like, you write it apart in two ways, in, in, in two, two pieces. So you write it as an average version plus the rest. Okay, and the average version is the integral of, so B, in, average t is the integral of t, plus, t to t plus 1 of B as ds. Okay. Um, now, this average version, of course, has, uh, has a derivative, which is just the difference of b at t plus 1 and t. So then a derivative is a perfectly fine function, as opposed to b prime, which is not a perfectly fine function. It's, it's, it's a distribution. And um, you can also make sense out of all this story in terms of distributions, but I'll, I'll put this aside for, for these lectures. Okay? So that's bt. And, and now, uh, you know, I'm just going to define uh, this, this uh, inner product, so FBF, in terms of this, this, this decomposition. Okay, so, so you can just write it as the integral of 0 to infinity um, uh, of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so integral of 0 to infinity of uh, f squared, and let me use this uh, b, b prime f, sorry, b bar prime uh, dx, okay? So, so this one is perfectly fine, okay? As long as, as, long as uh, the only issue is here whether this converges, whether b bar, bar prime is not too large, so that's, that's the only thing we have to look at. And then, and then we do the second part, which is an integration by parts. You do that by integration by parts, so f prime f of b um, tilde uh, x dx. OK? So integrating against the derivative of this, we write the first, first part just directly, and the second part we write using integration by parts. That we can just take it to be the definition, and I just have to say that this is not going to be too large. Uh, so, so let's see why is that. So this comes from the following um, uh, bounds. So if you look at this b tilde bar, b tilde prime, or b bar prime, which is a perfectly nice function, uh, uh, and and even, and also if you can just look at the b tilde, both of these guys are uh, stationary Gaussian processes okay, as a function of t. So basically, and they're actually, you know, the correlation decays very fast. I think if you go from uh, x to x plus 1, they're already, they, it becomes independent. So basically, these things as a function of time, they just look like uh, IID sequences of normals, except they made it to be continuous in some sense. Okay, so, so, so just like for any of those things, it's, it's not so hard to, to prove. I'll give you as an exercise that these, 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 these things are both less than or equal to, say, an absolute value even, of, um, of some constant times the square root. This is a random constant, a random constant for Ivan, uh, uh, which is, which is uh, log, let's say, 2 plus x. Right? So, so that's, that's, how, that's how IID normals grow. And you can, of course, say more precise bounds. And I think what we really need from this is, uh, are two things. So first of all, uh, we'll need that this b bar prime eh, is then, then we'll, it just follows from this. So it'll be less than or equal to some constant depending on epsilon plus epsilon times t. Okay, that's, that's what we need. And, and the other thing, uh, this is just the direct uh, consequence of that. For every epsilon, you can do this. And then you can also do the same thing for b tilde squared. Okay. So that's, again, let's uh, satisfy this inequality. Okay. And um, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's what we'll use. And now we just, just use this equation to to bound this inner product here, okay, so or the absolute value of this. So 
Okay, so let's call this star. And um, okay, so the absolute value of star is less than or equal to. So first, uh, the first one we can just uh, right. You can really replace this b by in prime by 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 the upper bound. Right. So so the upper bound will give us c epsilon. So that gives you a c epsilon times epsilon. Uh, uh, L2 norm of f, right? And then square root of f, not C3, C epsilon. Thanks. And, uh, and then there is a, you know, you can use this epsilon t is, uh, is upper bounded by the, the area norm, so f a f. Okay, so that's the first term. Okay, and the second term, well, you have to do, right? So, so this thing, um, you can split this into sum of squares, this product. Um, but you have to do it in an uneven way. So, so f prime should get a, a little bit less weight so that I can make that arbitrary small. So I, I will write this as, <coughs> this is less than or equal to the integral, epsilon times the integral of f prime. Uh, squared dx plus 1 over epsilon. So this is my uneven splitting right, times the integral of f. And now f squared. And now I'm going to do the upper band on, on, on the b tilde, which I, which I used here, b tilde squared, which, which I'm using here. So I just write c epsilon plus epsilon t. <coughs> um, dt, dx. Okay, so that's nice. Maybe maybe I'd better do it with epsilon squared so that this is still small. <coughs> okay, so I can do that. Am I doing this right? No, no, no. Um, yeah, I can make this epsilon squared. Just put your c epsilon squared, okay, and then. then I'm um, good. So, so, so now, and, and I just have to bound this. And as you can see, you have uh, an epsilon times an area norm again, plus some constant, again, depending on epsilon, a different constant times L2 norm squared f. OK? So here is, a, here is the proof. Of, of what I did, of, of what we claim. So this 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 one goes into the area norm, right? And this guy, other guy, also goes into the area norm, this t thing, and then that just gives you the L2 norm. <coughs> or maybe maybe I have to have here two area norms, but that's fine. Well, no, I'm just I'm just bounding these, so, so okay, that's good. Okay, so so we proved this. So, um, okay, and and by adding these things together, right, we get the e equation that we claimed last time, namely that the area beta is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times the area plus c epsilon times the identity, and you have a lower bound uh, again here, the same kind. And the same thing holds, uh, and same thing holds for the k tagging value. And as as you know that the lambda k of the array, so is it was a sim asymptotic to some uh, constant. This is a, this is an explicit constant that I don't remember now. Uh, k to the k to the two third, and and this implies that also the beta ones have this asymptotics. Okay. So I like to call this uh, the Wigner semicircle law for the stochastic area operator, because this sort of tells you, if you think about it, that <coughs> if you if you sort of draw the density of uh, of states or the or the, the eigenvalue empirical eigenvalue distribution, 
this fact that the case is at k-thirds actually gives you, shows you that if you draw the histogram, then you essentially see here a parabola, or you know, square root of k kind of function, which is just the, the edge of the semicircle. So, so that's what you expect to see, right? When you, you just focus on the edge, then you'll see the edge of the semicircle. Uh, in there. Okay, so, so that's already one thing that we proved, uh, you know, about general uh, beta ensembles just using this representation. Yeah, it wasn't very difficult. Uh, I'm going to go on and prove some other things, unless you have some questions now. Okay, no questions. Uh, so what else can you do? Well, another nice thing that you can prove uh, relatively easily are the tail bounds. So, yes, 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 exactly. So, so, so you're talking about this constant? Yeah. Yeah. No, this inequality, okay, <laughs> is true like this. It's the same constant. There is no, you just replace the operator by its eigenvalues and it's perfectly okay to do. Okay, like that. And of course, uh, you know, if, if this is true, for every epsilon there exists some random C epsilon that this holds, then it implies that. Yes, Arjun. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually proved it. Uh, we only proved it for GOE, but, the, but, the, but the pr there's no difference in the proof, clearly. It proves for all beta. Mm -hmm. Both of the proofs work for all beta. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is some very refined version of it, right? You zoom in near the edge, and you take a limit, and it's still kind of semicircular in this, in this kind of weak sense. <sighs> all right. So, Let's 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 uh, try to. So 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 first of all, here is now a definition. Trace of it on beta, okay, as a distribution, is is equal to minus lambda one of the area beta operator. Okay, so so this is. This defines the trace of it on this beta distribution for betas that are not classical. And for betas, when the, for betas that are classical, this is a theorem that we actually prove now. So, that you can represent the trace of it on distribution this way. And as you know, you might have seen this before, the trace of it on distribution just looks like anything else. Um, uh, snake eating the elephant, but but uh, and, you, and and you know it's very hard to distinguish them for various betas, or it's very hard to distinguish them from anything that looks like this in general. But 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 they have these nice properties that, of course, this is about the top eigenvalue, and it's asymmetric. It's much harder for the, the top eigenvalue to go back to the bulk because it has to push everybody else down. Than to go outside, right? So, so, so this, this tail, um, this tail is 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 uh, fatter than Gaussian, so it's e to the minus, actually two thirds, beta. Uh, uh, let me put a to the one half, a to the three halves, right? Okay, so that's that's the probability that you're in that tail, and, and in this tail. Uh, it's, it's, it's thinner than Gaussian, so it's e to the minus beta over 24 a cubed. Okay. So all of these are not too difficult to prove, uh, just using what you already know. And what I'm going to do uh, the rest of the lecture is, is prove this one. Okay. So, so what is precisely the theorem? We write it like this. So the probability 
that trace with them uh, beta is less than a is equal to this and maybe put here a beta plus little o one uh, this is as a converges to infinity so that's the that's the only that's the minus a sorry okay that's 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 the theorem um and, and really, the upper bound here is the, is the one that's easiest and is actually real fun. And I'll tell you why. Uh, part of it is because it's a proof in which, while you're doing the proof, you get to be a physicist without a punishment. Right? So, so you know, you, you always go to the physicist and tell them, well, what you do is not rigorous. And uh, the physicists say, well, yeah, but they give you the right answer. So in this proof, you can do the same thing. And in, in fact, it's not, you know, in fact, it will give you a proof. So it will actually be rigorous, even though you do have to do some guesswork. So, so here is uh, the nice thing. So, so lambda 1 uh, is minus the trace of them, remember? So you want to look at this event, right? Uh, so if lambda 1 is greater than a, then the really quotient formula gives you that if, you, if I take f comma a beta f, so the inner product, right, then this is, it just has to be greater than a times the L2 norm of f squared, right? Because the lambda 1 is just the infimum of the ratio of this and that over all f. Okay, so, so the probability of this is upper bounded by the probability of this. Okay? When you actually want to get the exact lambda 1, then you have to optimize over all f, including random f that depend on a. Okay? But at this level of crudeness, or this level of asymptotics, you don't have to take random f. You can just pick some deterministic f. Okay? So, no matter what f you pick, so this is the physicist part, no matter what f you pick, you get, you get a bound. And the bound is, 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 is correct. But of course you want to pick a good f. Now how you pick a good f, you don't have to tell anyone. As long as you pick, pick one, it works. It's fine. So I'm going to try to tell you, but, you know, I still, I won't tell you Precisely because I want to be enjoy I want to enjoy being a physicist here. Um, okay. So so let's look at this. So so f a beta f. So what is the probability of this? So so let's let's write it like this. So f a beta f. Let's write, write it out. So you have in the in here you have the airy part. So you have an f prime plus you have the f square root of x, uh, two norm squared, right? Plus you have this guy, which is the f. Uh, uh, well, how should I do it? I'm going to do it in a very silly way now, but anyway. So maybe I write it like this. So this is the integral of f, f squared b prime dx, OK? Um, okay, and this has to be greater than or equal to uh, a times f l t norm. Okay, so we're interested in the probability of this. And again, any time you can give a bound on this probability for any f, that's an upper bound on this. So, so let's see what's happening here. Well, just take an f, this, this, and this, and this are perfectly fine deterministic things, right? Let's just compute them. It's what you have to focus on is what is this? So what is it? You're integrating a square of a function, or, or a square of a function, which is itself a function, against uh, white noise, okay? But it's a deterministic function, so it's just a Paley integral, okay? Uh, which is just a normal random variable. There is you know, nothing special here. It's just a normal random variable. What's the, what's the variance of the normal random variable? It's just the L2 norm of this function. 
okay? which, is the L, which is the fourth moment norm, L4 norm of F. Okay, so the L2 norm of F squared. Okay, so I can replace this here. Um, I can replace this here by a, normal, a standard normal multiplied by, let's see if I do it right, uh, the fourth moment, I think, of F, like that. Um, is it squared? I, I, I think it's, it's maybe like this, is it, no? One fourth, maybe squared, yeah, maybe squared. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. squared, not to the fourth power, yeah. Um, okay, so, so what is it? This is a tail inequality for a normal random variable, okay? It's the, it's the simplest thing that you have seen in your life. Right? So anything like this uh, you can easily study. Don't throw your sponge at your coffee. It's a bad idea. Um, okay, so, so this is a given upper bound, so maybe twice, so, so just a normal tail boundary. You re rearrange everything of, uh, oh, what happened to my inequality? <laughs> okay, we, we rearrange everything of, uh, for, for the, for, for, so that one side you have this normal, and the other side you have this thing, and you write it so, uh, and you use the standard normal p tail bound, which is e to the minus x squared over 2. Um, so, you, so, so you get here, I think, the L4 norm of f, and now to the fourth power. And here upstairs, you have a square, I think, 1, 2 here. Um, it's a minus. And you, and you pack in all these things that come up, right? So, so this is A. Uh, prime squared plus F square root of X. L2 norm squared plus A times F like this. Mm. Um, yeah, something should be minus, so, so figure it out. It should be like this in the end. Yeah. A is minus A? Yeah. I think the point is, yeah, the point is that this, nor I think we're talking about this normal has to be very large. Um, Greater than A. You know what? Uh, this, this, there is no point in for you, you. You guys figure this out. This should be. This should. This should be. This should be the end. Okay. There's some sign mistake. <coughs> so. Okay. So now there is. There comes the the argument. So. So what you what do you want to do? Right. You want to maximize this thing. This is, this is your job. <laughs> okay. What's in here? So you can see this is at least homogeneous in F, so that's good. So multiplying by a constant doesn't change. And it's a, it, it, comes, it becomes a variational problem, so you can use it to solve it with Lagrange multipliers, except you can't because it's too complicated. So basically what you try to do in, in, in all these cases is you want to see, well, one of these things will probably not matter. So you, uh, and, and I will see from the next argument, maybe you will see, uh, that actually the one that does not, not matter is the optimizing f you expect it to be kind of flat. This derivative is not going to be that important, so, so you just take this guy out. Okay, and, and then, you, then you optimize that. Now that you can solve. Yeah. And I tell you what the solution is, and I'll tell you what the, the answers are. So, so the actual solution is f equal to <clears throat> so the, the real thing is the square root of, oh wow, I get it right. Yeah. 
a minus x plus. Okay, f of x. Okay, so, so let me draw this function. It's just a square root function like this. Okay. So this is essentially what you want f to be, but, but this quite, won't quite work because, because it, first of all, it doesn't satisfy the, the boundary condition here. And also you get too much, uh, too much L, uh, uh, <coughs> too much Dirichlet norm from this part. So what you do is you cut this off by, here you just put a line of slope one. So you put some means, which is a minus x plus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's one cutting, and then and you also cut it here, like that. So you put the min of x times a, I think. Okay, so th that's a steep one, but it's, it's fine. It's fine to make it too steep. So, so again, you solve the variation of the problem, x times square root of a, that's what it says. Um, so sum the variation of problem, and then, and then you get this function, and you, 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 of course, uh, the variation of problem ignored this term, so 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 it won't necessarily be nice for that term, and, and it, but a small modification will, will will be nice. So that's what we do. <laughs> okay, and and now I'll just give you the answers here. Which you can, while I'm writing it, you can do this in your head. So, the integrals. The L2 norm squared is A cubed over 2. The L, the F prime norm uh, squared, I think, is big O of A. So it's, it's, it's very small, it's, it's not important. The, the root XF norm squared is a cubed over six. Um, and where is my fourth norm? Yeah, there you go. The, the fourth norm is a cubed over three. Okay, so you put this together and plug them in here and you get that. Okay, so that's the end of, of, of the upper bound proof. Okay, any, any questions? Um, that, yeah, because it's squared up here, you see? So this is, everything up there is a cubed times, and then you divide by a cubed again, so you get... <coughs> Okay. Ah, uh, no, no, that's that's not a dumb question. Um, 